All right, can we start uh, with uh, 20 years of uh, Linux virtual memory? And uh, I'm Andrea Arcangeli, I work for Red Hat. I've been working on the kernel for about the last 20 years. Most of the time on uh, virtual memory, uh, memory management, uh, virtualization memory management, so shadow page tables, and uh, uh, lately also things connected with the cloud, so how to export often kernel features like user fault FD to high level, you know, uh, options in uh, uh, management tools or uh, high level management uh, system like OpenStack or uh, OVIRT. So today I'm going to speak about some of uh, uh, the basics of the memory management in Linux, uh, some of the major milestones, and then we'll focus on the latest innovations and the direction that Linux is going. And the topics about the innovation will be about uh, automatic NUMA balancing, uh, some of the THP developments, transparent huge pages, and uh, KSM scale, it's something just merged in 4.13. And uh, we'll see also user fault FD, which is still in development. Uh, we got m more features merged in 4.11, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, the basic uh, of uh, the virtual memory system in Linux is uh, uh, created on uh, what uh, the hardware provides, which are the page tables. Page tables are implemented in the hardware and uh, they allow us to create what uh, is virtual memory. So they are virtual pages, they cost absolutely nothing. They are the one in green. And they can point to physical pages because we establish the page table in a way that a virtual page will point to a physical page. And if you have two virtual pages pointing to the same physical page, then you have shared memory. As far as the hardware is concerned, it's as simple as that. Uh, the page tables are a uh, Radix tree, on the x86 at least, on the other architecture is different, but in the common code of Linux, there's still a Radix tree of page tables. Then other architectures then implement their own hashes and, and their own TLB management based on the common code page tables, which are very similar to the x86. And uh, on the x86-64 in particular, we have uh, 512 uh, pointers for each level. So this defines uh, the maximum amount of uh, uh, physical memory you can map and, and uh, virtual memory can, you can map. And in five uh, levels uh, have been introduced in uh, the very latest version, which is for 13, and the maximum amount before was 256 terabytes, and with five levels, so imagine one more layer of this stuff <laughs> in the tree, uh, we can now manage 128 petabyte or something with the I, uh, so it's, it's a multiple of uh, two. And uh, it's this five level option, however, it's a configuration option. So when you configure the kernel, you will be asked if you want to build it with five levels uh, page table support because it's, it would slow down the kernel if constantly we were to add an additional layer of checks. So it's a configuration option. And uh, to understand the memory management, you need to understand the fabric of the virtual memory, which are all the data structure which uh, connects uh, uh, things like page table, which are provided by the hardware, to create the abstraction we generally work with. And the abstraction we generally work with are tasks, processes, uh, virtual memory areas created by MMAP, glibc, malloc. All of these things are then translated into a uh, data structure in the kernel. And uh, the fabric is uh, required to be understood for uh, you to start uh, understanding the internals of the memory management. And uh, uh, on top of these data structures, we have the VM heuristics. And the VM heuristics are computing on it, uh, but they solve problems which don't have a guaranteed perfect solution. For example, one of these problems is when is the perfect time to start unmapping pages and start swapping? So there's no perfect solution to this problem. And we don't know. And uh, that's why they are heuristics after all. So you can imagine it like a number of data structure with heuristic computing on time 
And all of it is about creating, you know, setup of page tables and starting IO to swap and these things. And one thing uh, which is special about uh, uh, Linux is that all free memory is used as cache. And we overcommit by default. I'm not sure if all the operating system are like that, but uh, uh, we made a very big effort to try not to ever waste any free memory. So this creates complications sometimes. But we need additional heuristics to manage that. And um, in fact, Android uses overcommit. So Android uh, is uh, setting overcommit memory, the last sys control I showed in the slide, to one. By default, it's set to zero, which means we do some checks. So when you do a malloc of you know, 10 terabytes and you only have four gigabytes, it's, set, it's telling you, no, there's not enough memory. But you can still allocate more memory than the total sum of uh, RAM plus swap, because the kernel is optimistic you want to use it all. And Android, however, is not even happy about those optimistic checks, so it disabled them all. So Android is completely overcommitted. Uh, the most basic data structure in the VM is the page structure. And we have a page structure for each page. Each page is generally 4K. So if you divide the 64 by 4096, which is the size of the struct page and the size of the page, you get that uh, about 1.56 of the memory of every Linux system out there is completely used in these struct pages. And so we make big efforts not to ever grow this structure, because the moment we grow it, we waste a huge amount of memory globally in all the phones, in all the servers, in all the desktops. So, uh, <coughs> this data structure is also very cache friendly. If you think about it, 64 bytes is ideal. Of course, it's cache line aligned, allocated cache line aligned. And uh, the then other best data structure are the MM. When we talk about MM, we generally mean a process. So from user land, you can imagine it like a process, and then you can have many threads working on the MM, and then these are the threads of the process. Inside the MM, you can have the VMA, uh, which are uh, virtual memory areas. These virtual memory areas are effectively created by MMAP, MMAP, all the syscalls you can do in user land. So when you locate memory and when you remove memory, you create this data structure and you add them in, in RB3 in various uh, data structures that can look them up. In addition to that, we have the cache. And uh, the cache is uh, uh, managed with uh, two last recently used lists. In reality, there are way more than two, but let's start with two, which are active and inactive. And uh, uh, inactive contains information which might be used once. So like uh, if you run a backup, you're writing the backup only once, then maybe not ever again in a couple of days. And so this data is going to be in the inactive list only, and it will be collected away. In the active, we try to keep your working set, like, you don't know, uh, your desktop uh, uh, window manager or whatever. And this was the original mitmap I wrote many years ago to show that. And uh, the two lists are balanced in a way that uh, when you get a reference on the inactive list, the pages are activated. And when uh, we shrink the active list, we put it back to inactive list until it gets freed. You can see the levels of uh, uh, the active and inactive list uh, in any Linux system by doing this grep command on slash proc slash meminfo. And as you can see, we have one for anonymous memory and one for uh, file backed memory. Uh, anonymous and file backed are the two main types of memory in Linux. And they are, I mean, quite different. And uh, anonymous is extremely simple. It's a memory you allocate with mal malloc. It's also the memory that gets swapped out. The file backend memory never, never gets swapped out, except uh, TMPFS. So uh, <coughs> recently, uh, two, three years ago, Johannes Weiner uh, found a way to balance even better the active and inactive list. So his idea was maybe uh, we have a working set A, B, C, D, e, F uh, until all the lowercase stuff, OK? This stuff is actually being referenced more frequently then the uppercase parts, each letter can be one page. So 
He thought, what if I have an additional information about these pages that I'm removing when I'm doing the reclaim, so the pages that go out of the inactive list? What if I can find that if I just shrank the active list a little more, I would have a much better working set in the active list, so basically dropping all the upper cases and replacing it with the lower case. And he did that by uh, introducing a, a new way to remove, um, uh, to reclaim pages from the radix tree. The radix tree is uh, representing the file. So it's just like the page table, but for the file offsets. Uh, so when you remove a page from the radix tree, now you are converting the node in an exceptional entry, and you add uh, in the exceptional entry a, a record of the sequence counter that you know, gives you enough information to, to compute that you may have to shrink the active list more aggressively and then everything will work much better. So now we have a proper way to do that. And the other critical piece in the VM is uh, uh, RMAP. So uh, the managing of uh, uh, object-based reverse mapping. So RMAP, the whole point of RMAP is to transform uh, a page structure into all the virtual addresses that are mapping it. So you want to resolve in reverse, generally the page table transforms a virtual address to a physical page. And you know the CPU needs that, we build the page tables. But we also need the reverse. And the reverse is not one on one. You have a single page, but it can be mapped by many, actually a limited number of virtual addresses. So not going into the detail of this one, this was sorted out mostly in the 2.6 kernel, about 2.65, 2.67. So it's, it's a long time we, we sorted it out and it keeps being improved though. Uh, especially the non VMA was massively improved recently, well, a couple of years ago, but still more recently than when, when it started. This is always in development. And this is a full picture of uh, uh, all these pieces connected. So you have all the page structure that represent each page, which are linked in active and inactive LRUs. And then they are also each page connected somehow to the virtual address that is being mapped. So this is a full picture of uh, uh, the current status of the VM. Unfortunately, I cannot literally picture it also with MemCG because right now we have an LRU for each C group because you want uh, to use C groups and you want to have a proper uh, aging of the cache inside your C group. This is about you know, making the containers way more friendly to each other. So if one container is trashing the cache, it's not going to screw with the other container cache. And so now the picture will be way more multidimensional, but this is the basic of how the VM works. So going to more recent stuff, what are the uh, recent virtual memory trends? Well, generally, we are trying to make things more intelligent. So we are trying to make, for example, uh, optimization for NUMA, which uh, uh, currently is called automatic NUMA balancing, which is uh, optimizing the workload that you're running on a NUMA server, and you know every two-socket system now is a NUMA system, and it's going to run massively slower if you don't optimize the workload for NUMA. So it's not very workable to use uh, hard bindings unless your application is very specific. And unless it does fix the amount of memory that you can place statically when you start the application. So with automatic number balancing, you can run any workload and the kernel will try to optimize it for you. Uh, other optimizations uh, that happened uh, are huge TBFS which was the only option before, and now you also have transparent huge pages. So huge TDBFS allows you to use uh, huge pages in your application, but you have to, to you ma a map from a special file system. You need some privilege to mount the file system. While uh, uh, transparent huge pages, you run the application unmodified with anonymous memory, you don't even notice, and it's actually using huge pages, the same huge pages that you will get from huge TDBFS. So again, not many people accept, again, the specific uh, application uh, which are kind of static, like databases which allocate a huge amount of memory for the SGA and the shared memory, and they put it all in huge TBFS. These are fine with huge TBFS, 
but the regular application will be much harder to port, and not many people was using actually uh, huge CLBFS before transparent huge pages were introduced. And uh, then we have uh, uh, KSM. KSM is a way to deduplicate memory of virtual machines, but not only virtual machines. You can use it in user land in your application, and it will just uh, compress equal pages. So it uh, deduplicates the memory. And we have also MMU notifier. MMU notifier allows to remove uh, the page pins. In, uh, uh, until a couple of years ago, most of the drivers, including RDMA, including uh, secondary memory, memory, memory management units, would pin the memory. Uh, even the GPU would pin the memory when it was doing DMA through it. Not needed anymore. Now you can even swap out the memory because with MMU notifier you have uh, enough management uh, at the driver level to know that the VM is about to swap out the page and it asks you, stop using it. And then your driver stops doing the DMA, flushes uh, all the caches, uh, synchronizes, and then let the VM, the VM unmap the page and swap it out. Uh, with the GPU, this goes even further now with HMM, which was just merged one week ago, and uh, uh, from my colleague uh, Jerome Gliss, and uh, uh, this uh, HMM uh, not only allows to swap out uh, some memory that uh, uh, is managed uh, by a driver directly with DMA, but it even allows to transparently use the GPU memory without you even noticing. So, like, you allocate some memory with malloc, you want to compute with, uh, I don't know, OpenCL, CUDA, whatever, on this memory using the GPU. Okay, the GPU can compute on the main memory, but it also has its own internal memory, which is way much faster. And so transparently, the kernel can transfer the memory to the GPU, and the moment the main CPU touches it again, the kernel will transfer it back, and it's all done through a combination of HMM and MMU notifier. And that also works when you swap out, of course. Question, okay, I think I need to throw the mythical microphone. So what you just described, it doesn't require cache coherence between the uh, GPU and the main memory. It is not required. No, absolutely not. Okay. So you have two different kind of memory, so it's not uh, shared memory. Okay. So, yeah, it's, it's disconnected. Okay, there is other question right there. I'll show it to you. Okay. Got it. So, any other question? Ah, sorry. Here we go. What, what about uh, persistent memory? Management does it impact uh, also because you are talking about new trends? Uh, you mean not volatile memory? Yeah, but uh, that are managed like uh, RAM memory. Just yes, no, that that's not a concern in this case for M MMU notifier because that's still in the primary MMU. MMU notifier only deals with different MMUs or memory which is not accessible by the main CPU and. The not volatile memory is definitely accessible like normal RAM. So that, that's kind of different problem. Okay, thanks. So we see now, uh, oh. To, uh, to, to sort of answer a little bit, uh, HMM has an extension called CDM, which may or may not have made it upstream yet, specifically to extend the concept to GPUs that do operate coherently. At the moment, the only one that do it is not yet released is going to be Power 9 with, uh, with, with uh, NVIDIA Volta. But uh, we will have a completely co cache coherent uh, interconnect. And in order to manage that migration transparently, uh, it's, we, we will piggyback on the core HMM uh, with some coherent extensions. Okay, sounds great. Thanks for the addition, <laughs> Benjamin. Let's try catch it again. So let's go ahead with uh, uh, some benchmark, which is going to show automatic number balancing in action. And uh, this is uh, an OLTP benchmark, so it's a database benchmark. And you're going to see uh, the performance as the number of users increases uh, with uh, uh, autonuma off, autonuma on, with, and autonuma on, but with numa pinning. So 
I should specify something. When you start pinning the memory with NUMA bindings, uh, automatic, NUMA, automatic NUMA balancing, so the intelligence in the kernel is basically disabled because the kernel notices that it cannot move the memory. You already pinned it. So the last one is just like with NUMA pinning. And as you can see, the improvement is very significant. And especially in the low user count, it's almost the same as doing hard bindings. So again, there are cases where the hard bindings are not possible. And uh, for the administrator, it will be a huge problem you know, to, to restrict and partition the machine by hand as the workload changes. Especially in the world of containers, Kubernetes is a complete uh, uh, difficulty. So we see also how to enable and disable uh, automatic NUMA balancing. That may be useful in case you need to do any debugging, any benchmarking. And this is, uh, of course, included in RHEL 7. So we have automatic NUMA balancing enabled by default in RHEL 7. So if you need to uh, enable it, of course, you need to check the, the hardware is really NUMA. But generally, if you have two sockets, it is. And uh, if NUMA control hardware sure multiple nodes, then you can disable it with uh, echo zero in uh, slash proxy scan and numa balancing or enable it again with echo one numa balancing. Then there are a few more tunings, but they shouldn't be required to be tuned, so. And you can also choose it at boot uh, with uh, a boot option, numa balancing equal uh, enable and disable. Question? Uh, for the numer auto balancing, uh, I had multiple cases on where the performance were worse with it enabled on Red Hat, uh, Red Hat 6 and Red Hat 5, uh, 7, uh, especially when it was discrepancy on the this, uh, on multiple threads that are sharing a common problems. So it's uh, the, the big uh, split of data is split in equal chunks. Yes. One job will finish in one minute, and the other in two. Uh, and so by turning off auto balancing, it reverts to the correct one. Okay, so the problem sometimes is when uh, there is thrashing and uh, the workload cannot possibly fit in a single node. So number balancing will try to figure out everything automatically, but it is possible this little overhead of having the scanning is increasing performance a little bit. So the problem with this intelligence is uh, Overall, it's a big improvement. You might always have some corner case, and that's specifically why I specified how to disable it so you can even measure yourself. But generally, it's a very big risk not to enable it. If you don't know, if you didn't do enough uh, profiling, and you're, you're not sure that you're actually in this corner case. Because running without uh, any NUMA knowledge in the kernel can mean running 20, 30% slower. So, if in the worst case, it shouldn't be a big slowdown anyway. So overall, it's still a big improvement, that's the thing. But you can tune it. That, that's why I specified how to do it. And also with the new scale like SP, there is the, the SNC, sub numa clustering. On one single node, you have two uh, numa uh, nodes. On one single socket, you have two numa nodes. Is it handled correctly with this? Well, the algorithm should be very similar. Uh, probably. So it, the problem is how fast the interconnects are. And if you have two physical sockets, you can see physically they are distant. Of course, they are slower, potentially slower at least, than if they are in the same uh, socket. So uh, I guess in this case, it will be less of an issue. But as long as they are NUMA and they have different memory channels, and they have, you know, each uh, CPU has its own memory bandwidth, and you multiply the memory bandwidth if each CPU talks to a different memory channel, then this numeristic will help. OK. So changing topic to huge pages. Uh, another thing which is very important for performance, in addition to num optimization, is to uh, increase the size of a page. The size of a page is, again, 4K. It's incredibly small by today's standards. And uh, what if you had bigger pages, like uh, two megabyte pages? which are 512 bigger. That's what the x86 architecture give us. They are a little on the big side, I have to say. But because now we have so much memory, they are starting to get more reasonable. Uh, maybe when we started it in uh, uh, 2010, it would have been better if it were a bit smaller, especially because it's difficult to create a 2 megabyte page. But now, 2 megabyte pages are of a reasonable size, even for AO almost. 
So in this case, uh, we were doing it with anonymous memory, and the whole point is to completely remove the last layer of the page tables. So from a CPU point of view, from an hardware point of view, all that we are doing is to remove one layer of page tables. And that's why it's running faster, of course. TLB miss is faster. The TLB cache itself is bigger because a single TLB entry can cache two megabytes. So the benefit of uh, uh, huge pages are several. Uh, so there is even page, implicit page coloring of the cache inside the huge page. But there are only very few cons. And so, again, so in these cases, when we do things automatically, you might always find a workload with some cons. And the only case here you can have a cons is when uh, your clear page or copy page uh, are going to waste more cache CPU cache in this case, because you're going to clear two megabytes instead of 4K before you can map the page in the user land. When you do malloc, malloc, nothing happens, right? After you touch the memory, you dereference the pointer, you write into the pointer. At that point, the kernel has to clear, uh, allocate and clear a page. And if the page is bigger, it has to clear two megabytes. And of course, that takes more time. Then there is another downside, which is uh, higher memory footprint, uh, because uh, you might be allocating one terabyte, might, might be you touch on only 4K every two megabytes of virtual addresses. And this would increase massively the memory usage if you enable transparent huge pages in this case. Of course, that's not a very smart thing to do. And that's why enabling transparent huge pages by default is quite reasonable. We'll see later that it's not so reasonable for files. But for anonymous memory, it's quite reasonable. Because, again, if an application is doing that, it's touching only 4K, it's only using 4K, for every two megabytes that it's allocating with malloc, it's probably not very smart. And then we have another source of problem, which is direct compaction, which generally is the main source of problems. So every time you read the, about complaints of THP running slower or something like that, is generally about direct compaction, and that has been improved massively in the latest kernels, so now we shouldn't even be an issue anymore. We'll see also later in how we can tune things even better. Um, <clears throat> it's also interesting that just a few weeks ago, there was a patch uh, merged in uh, 4.13, which is simply, uh, instead of doing clear page for the two megabyte in order, it's clearing everything but the last sub-page. And then it clears the last sub-page. It actually does a little bit of clear around, but it makes sure the address, the virtual address, where the fault happened, the sub-page that contains such virtual address is the last one which gets cleared before the THP is mapped in user land. And this simple change, it just, you know, instead of clearing in order, you just clear a little bit around and make sure the hint is the last one getting cleared, increases some benchmark 28%. Because the address will be touched immediately, and so by clearing the page last, you make sure the piece of the page that is going to be accessed immediately after the fault is resolved, it's already in the CPU cache, and it's practically guaranteed. So you see it's still a huge margin for optimization even after years and years that transparent huge pages was merged. It's interesting because we already researched in this stuff. We tried non-temporal stores to clear uh, the page. We said, yes, we tried to waste less cache. Why don't we bypass the cache entirely? But that turns out to be slower because then some part of the page will be accessed and then you're going to hit memory twice if you use non-temporal stores. So uh, this trick works much, much better, I have to say. And it's actually much simpler too. Because non-temporal store requires writing assembly, so there's no assembly in, in this code. So uh, the main reason why uh, THP also helps so much with KVM and virtualization is because we have two layers of page tables when uh, we run in guest mode. So when you run a KVM virtual machine, uh, THP helps tremendously, both in the guest and in the host. So it has to be enabled both ways. So you can enable UGTLBFS in the host, UGTLBFS in the guest, the performer will be the same, but the important is you need huge pages when you do build. That's extremely important for performance. Both with EPT and even without EPT, actually, not only with EPT. So 
Uh, the design of transparent huge pages uh, is uh, very black and white uh, compared to how other operative system implemented it. And the idea is to use uh, transparent huge pages whenever possible. Whenever the VMA, so the, the virtual memory area that you allocated with MLOC, with, M, with MMAP, MAP Anonymous, can fit a huge page, the kernel will try to use it. Uh, the other constraint is that compaction must have been able to produce it. So we have an algorithm called memory compaction. Its point, its objective is to create large physical pages out of small fragmented pages. Uh, the tunings for THP, the main tunings you should be aware about to optimize and test things related to transparent huge pages are a slash sys kernel mm transparent huge pages enabled, and this is the, ma the main knob. So if it's always, and it's by default it should be always, uh, it always try to use THP if uh, the VMA allows. M advice means only use THP inside applications, for example, incidentally, QEMU, which is using MADV huge page. Oops, there is missing V, but uh, it's still MADV huge page. Uh, which uh, uh, will use, uh, I don't know, a uh, huge amount of virtual memory. So you start very large guests. You want all the guests, like I said in the previous slide, uh, to use transparent huge pages. So uh, if you are concerned about the higher memory utilization, maybe you work in an embedded and you need to run a virtual machine, despite it's an embedded system, and you say, well, I really don't want to risk to use even one more byte, I rather, to use, I rather want to be slower than to use any more byte of memory, then you can set it to M advice. And then you are sure that at least QEMU, because it's using the M advice, is still going to get huge pages. And there's no downside for uh, KVM and QEMU to use uh, huge pages, because you know the gas is going eventually to touch all the memory, generally speaking. You can also disable it, of course. If you set it to never, you can disable it. Sensor is the main other tuning, and generally everybody that is concerned or has trouble with transparent huge pages doesn't have trouble because it's set to always, the enabled, but it's, it has trouble because the frag is set to always. And the frag set to always means always use direct compaction. Yes, question? I have, uh, no, I don't have it. What happens uh, when using THP if an application allocates uh, two megabytes uh, using a map, for example, it transparently gets a huge page, and suddenly it wants to punch uh, a 4K hole uh, in this area. Uh, is the hole already punched, and maybe the pages are transformed into regular pages, or uh, what happens? Yes, exactly. Okay. The, the hole is punched, and the pages are transformed into 4K pages. In addition, uh, the 4K will be also freed. Uh, right now, it's freed in a deferred way. Because right now, in the very latest kernels, there has been a slight redesign of uh, how the ref counting works. And so the freeing is not instant, but the page will be splitted later. Okay. So, but from an application point of view, you can see it. So it's just about the total free memory in the system that it will be freed, not instantly like it was in the initial THP implementation, but a bit later. Thank you. You're welcome. So uh, anybody who has problems with uh, uh, performance should first thing set the, the frag to M advice. And I put the defer and the fair plus M advice in grayed out a color because it's reported that it doesn't really perform. And uh, this was upstream developments that drove this in this direction. And there is hope that it will eventually perform. So the design sounds reasonable. I think it's only the implementation which is not good enough yet. So for now, I only recommend M advice, which is also an upstream uh, viable def default, and always. Uh, you can set it to never, in which case, uh, uh, it's not going to do uh, any compaction. So there is another thing you should know, for example, if you want to run benchmarks. And uh, uh, THP is an optimistic uh, uh, algorithm. So because compaction is not deterministic, you're not guaranteed that you're getting these transparent huge pages every single time that you run your program. 
So how do you make sure you're getting all the pages your program needs? You can run these two commands, which are echo three in drop caches, and then echo anything into compact memory. Of course, you need to be a privileged user, root. And then you can see that the number of pages in each body and uh, in each body slot is uh, internal free lists, and we have a free list for each page size. And uh, the first one corresponds to 4K pages, the second one 8K pages, 16, 32, 64. So the only pages which are worth for THP are the ones in the 2 megabyte and 4 megabyte slots. Anything smaller cannot be mapped in a, a, as a new page in userland because the page table on the x86 only support 2 megabyte pages, not anything smaller. So before running the priming, this was on my firewall, which was running for a long time. So it was very fragmented. And uh, uh, you can see there are uh, four pages in the DMA zone and eight pages of uh, DMA32, which would be suitable. So you basically only have a dozen of pages in total, which is about 24 megabytes. Uh, the moment you freed all the slabs and all the caches, you didn't actually increase it so much because often these slabs and caches were fragmented. So if you trigger the memory compaction then, then you get a reasonable amount of uh, huge pages that will allow your program to run reproducibly with transparent huge pages always. So since uh, version 4.8, we have transparent huge pages in TMPFS. And uh, by default, uh, it's set to never, which is the current default, like I said. But there is another interesting option if you want to test it, and this promises very big uh, improvement in performance. I'm not even sure if within size should be the new default. But if you mount uh, or, or remount, in this case, slash dev slash shm, or wherever you put TMPFS in your system, with, uh, uh, within size, Every time you create a, an inode with an i size, so effectively the size of the file, bigger than 2 megabyte, you will get transparent huge pages into the file. And uh, why is it not always what I recommend as default? Well, because you may have a huge number of small files. Maybe you unpack a kernel tree into TMPFS. You don't want to take 2 megabyte of memory for every single file, which is 4K, OK? It's not something unreasonable to unpack many small file and file system as much as it is unreasonable to allocate a one gigabyte and only use 4K for each two megabyte of the one gigabyte you allocated. So it's different uh, how we need to manage the things compared to what we do for anonymous memory. Anonymous memory, when it's allocated, generally it's always used. So there's a very high probability that it's used. In this case, if the file is small, there's absolutely no guarantee that the file size will increase anytime soon. So that's why within iSize is better than always for TMPFS. What about the SHMM? So SHMM, a uh, shared memory in general, uh, uses an internal hidden mount of TMPFS. So TMPFS, shared memory uh, with IPC API, with memfds call, with map shared of slash dev slash zero, or map shared combined with map anonymous, or even DRM objects and uh, I, uh, ASHMM, which is a placement for something Android uses in a different way. Uh, see, all these things are completely identical to TMPFS internally to the kernel. I mean, when the VM starts wrapping out the memory, there's no difference. It's just an API difference. And because you don't have a mount point for this stuff, we have a, a knob in a slash sys kernel mm transparent which page SHMM enabled that has all the previous option, in addition, it also has deny and force. And these two options are a complete turn off or complete turn on of uh, transparent switch pages in every mount of the MPFS, including the internal one and every other one. They are mostly for debugging, of course, for testing, debugging, or for emergency, maybe you have an application which tries to use huge pages, but you find it uh, you know, slower or problems implementation, you know, it's all been merged in 4.8, and because it's set to never, I'm not sure how many people are using it in production. So it's going to be in production soon anyway. 
And uh, then we have KSM scales. This is a problem we had to deal with one year ago, and uh, it's got merged uh, the solution in 4.13, just again a few months ago. And uh, uh, the problem was, uh, what about uh, doing the duplication of huge number of pages? How many pages can we deduplicate? Well, uh, actually it's unlimited, because it's only limited by the virtual uh, address space. And if even on 32-bit architectures, yes, you have in each process four gigabytes, not more, but you can have many processes and you can run the duplication across different processes, so there's really no limit in sight if you have a huge system like with one terabyte of memory, but even 128 gigabytes of memory, because again, this is virtual that we are duplicating. And uh, so what was happening is uh, KSM runs in the background. Generally, you don't want to fire all the CPUs. Right now, there's a patch of stream I'm discussing sort of multi-threaded KSM implementation, completely different from KSM, but uh, generally you don't want to fire all the CPUs at that. You just put a little bit of KSMD in the background, or maybe you just dedicate a single core of the system to doing the duplication of virtual machine memory. And so you don't notice that this thing is building up, but over time, one day, uh, one week, one month, you end up potentially with one million pages being duplicated in the single same KSM page. And internally, uh, we need to maintain an error map because we might want to migrate the KSM page from one PC memory to another PC memory to do compaction, for example. Because if we cannot migrate KSM pages, KSM pages becomes like uh, blocks that fragment the memory that we cannot move, okay? So every KSM page needs a map to do the migration. He needs it for the swapping. He needs also for automatic number balancing because automatic number balancing can want to move a KSM page from one node to another node. So this list was actually unlimited. And so the moment the, uh, the system decided to do a compaction event and, migration, and to migrate one KSM page, uh, which had this kind of sharing, the system will hang for several seconds. And that was a massive problem. It could hang for minutes. Uh, so we solved it uh, in the most uh, uh, deterministic and black and white way. So there were many ways to solve it, but this is the only definitive way, which is to put a maximum limit on the sharing. To do that, I had to build a multidimensional RB3. But let's keep it simple. It's just you know like a compression limit. So you know. If you have the same page a million of times equal in your system, it's going to create many KSM pages, all equal, but each KSM page will represent only 256 virtual addresses. So the list will be limited to the max page sharing. And you know, 256 is quite a good enough compression ratio, right? So uh, <laughs> getting higher, and this 256 value, which I set as default, is only giving you diminishing returns. So there are not that many pages that need that, many, that much deduplication. So this is actually made KSM uh, enterprise uh, compliant. So you can run a KSM as much as you want. It's never going to interfere with the system. Question? Um, don't you have an issue if uh, you have a NUMA system and uh, your pages is deduplicated from two nodes where two workloads are, are operating and now you have one of your guy having to do cross uh, fabric accesses uh, and shouldn't we have effectively limited deduplication within a node? Yes, that's a very good question. So uh, it says uh, um, syscontrol called it uh, um, merge across nodes. By default, it's one, so it's not doing what you're suggesting. If you set it to zero, it's exactly doing what you're suggesting. So we have, uh, we basically create a stable and unstable RB tree, this is multidimensional trees, one for each node. And we deduplicate only within the node, while we, st we can still migrate memory through the nodes. So it's, I think it's already optimized. And uh, by default, it's disabled because it will use more memory. So by <laughs> By default, uh, we try to optimize uh, for the maximum uh, deduplication. For example, Obvious has a high level 
a management setting that you can already uh, make a, a tuning uh, from you know the web interface to optimize for NUMA on, on KSM. So it's, it's handled. Good question. One more question. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry about the, the in my case I've missed something because if you are spawning let's say 100 VMs that share the same page, one process is allowed to move from one node to another. Only that and there is a penalty of doing that because uh, the process of, of migrate to the new node have to go through to reach the page. So if you are allowing 260, 260 time using the reusage of the same page, then you can live in a position where, I mean, every single node is accessing the same page over and over and over. And maybe at some point it's interesting to, to avoid the duplication to get the data local to the same node. Yeah. Isn't it? So uh, basically the... 256 limit is for each KSM page, but with this change now, there are many equal KSM pages. So each KSM page will only contain memory that was duplicated from the node where the VM was running on. So it's, it's not really a limit. It's simply saying it's a limit for each individual KSM page, but we broke the invariant that a single content of the page only has a single KSM page. Now there are infinite number of KSM pages for each content. And each one can contain 256 of the duplicated memory. So by, uh, if you enable uh, merge across nodes and you set it to zero, so if you enable the NUMA optimization, then uh, these KSM pages will belong to the node where the VM was running on, and there are many of those, so it's, it's normal. You should be quite optimal already, I hope so. But the VM can move. I mean, the process can be rescheduled to any other core. Yes, uh, in this case, uh, the KSM, uh, sh the, the NUMA balancing will figure it out. Like I said, it will do, it will trigger a migration of KSM page, and it will, uh, let's say, optimize it uh, with uh, automatic NUMA balancing. Okay. So it's, it's really complicated how the migration of KSM pages work when NUMA optimization are enabled. In fact, there was a bug, I fixed it, so. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Very good question. One more question. Uh, I'm sorry, it's just really a question so much as a, a, a bit of an objection. You said that turning on KSM, you know, it's not, um, it's not going to make anything worse. But there are, I mean, there is the, there is the security, the, the inherent security issue that you can have that you have information leak, uh, you have a kind of a side channel between processes and VMs. Yes, that I think requires an entire talk. <laughs> so raw hammer, raw hammer, okay, I will try to you know, say the smallest possible thing, which goes to the point which is raw hammer is an hardware bug. And the complaints and the changes should go in the hardware. And instead of this and as software changes to merge, okay? And it's reasonable because we have to deal with uh, buggy hardware, but there is ECC memory. Use ECC memory or anything where you need security, okay? ECC memory will stop absolutely, the hammer. Absolutely, but even without that, there's, you, have, you, have a, you have a side channel. Side channel, right. Side channel, you have it also with hyperthreading, and so unless you disable also hyperthreading, you don't have to worry about KSM. So I totally agree. Plus, we have also the uh, LibSSL re-implementation. Now, there are also in the kernel ES uh, algorithms which are uh, timing secure, so you cannot time much out of it uh, through side channels. So there are all kind of measures to, to tackle these security issues. So again, for raw hammer, ECC memory or good memory, drop the memory which is broken by raw hammer, or just don't complain if something bad happens. We can still get software changes. I mean, I'm not completely against making changes to KSM to, for example, detect when somebody exploits raw hammer. We could use a checksum to know if one of the KSM pages was altered, for example. So we, we can do many things, but the point is she should not be enabled by default because this is an hardware bug. So in my opinion, the current code is fine. For the side channel, again, uh, if you enable hyperthreading, well, probably there's not much to care about KSM. If you don't enable hyperthreading, then yes, you might want to disable KSM. 
so it's, uh, it should be really a cloud maintainer or, or cloud manager decision to, to take these uh, positions. But, you know, it's, it's reasonable and there are many points of view on these uh, aspects. So I, I would just say a few words on uh, user fault FD, which is the last topic. And uh, memory externalization is about uh, being able to run uh, local memory and external memory. So you're running in a node and computing on another node. Uh, in this case, uh, with QEMO, that is post-copula migration, because post-copula migration starts uh, the virtual machine in the destination node where you're doing the line migration while the memory is still aside in the source. And uh, the user fault FD provides very good latency, uh, comparable to very fast uh, swapping over extremely fast SSD. And this is a live migration without uh, post-copula migration. This is with post-copula migration. As you can see, the previous one couldn't even possibly complete. It kept trying, but it never completed. And it was quite slower. This is uh, a number of transactions per second in the database workload. With uh, post-copula migration, it completed. And then it took a little bit to recreate the huge pages. Because then here at this point, uh, it was already completed, the post-copy, but it kept a little bit to go to peak level because KE huge page D had to recreate the pages which were copied with user fault FD. User fault FD, by default, with post-copula migration, uses 4K pages. It can also use huge pages, but not yet. Uh, <coughs> This is in production since RHEL 7.3, and the total migration time is massively faster, of course, uh, even than auto-converge, because auto-converge was throttling and slowing down the CPU too much. Auto-converge means slowing down the gas, just so it creates less dirty pages, so it can eventually converge and migrate. Uh, same for the latency. The latency was much better. Uh, we have a huge number of new features for 4.13 of uh, user fault FD. And uh, I said uh, uh, two megabyte pages were not supported back then, but they are supported now. So we have support for huge TLBFS and uh, also shared memory TMPFS, all kind of TMPFS. We have a new thread ID, so you can know which thread ID triggered the fault. We have this special feature specifically required by Oracle to make Oracle more secure. So the SGA, the huge, uh, huge LBFS region they allocate when Oracle starts, which contains all the database memory, they can make sure there's no uh, bug or no uh, memory corruption can happen on this memory when it's not yet allocated because they can trap it with user fault today. And then we have Creo. Creo is doing live migration with post-copy of containers without virtual machines. And it's using all this feature at the end, which are non-cooperative events. So Creo is notified not only of the page faults, but Creo is also notified about any uh, MADV remove, uh, don't need free, uh, any MR map, any MR map, any fork, because fork has to create a new user fault video also for the child task. And it's going to go through the main one with the event fork. There are also in progress features which are uh, <coughs> write protected. So we can also uh, not only being notified when a page is missing, but also when a page is write protected. So you can write protect a single 4K page without modifying any VMA. So it's fully scalable with a map sem for reading. No need of calling M protect anymore. And you will get an user fault if somebody writes to it. And you can also map it back into the guest uh, if it was missing as write protected, which is needed for some kind of uh, tracking of uh, DRT memory. And you can also remove memory atomically from the guest and put it some other place that you can transfer it to the network. So effectively, you can swap in user land, kind of. You can do all kind of software things with this thing. The main thing you get is a message, which is being interpreted in different ways depending on the event that so was triggered. And the use cases are uh, efficient snapshotting, uh, removal of write bits from uh, JIT and to native compilers, and uh, adding robustness to huge LBFS, you already mentioned it, and uh, host enforcement of virtualization memory ballooning. So when the balloon inflates a page, you can mark it uh, with user fault FD 
Uh, and uh, you will be notified if the gas try to deflate the balloon because you will get a new fault, and this is all for free. Yeah. And so of course, in such case, you should probably kill the guest. You can do distributed shared memory uh, and series research in CISADA with user fault FD at Berkeley and University of Colorado. There is also another research from uh, LLNL.gov uh, uh, from uh, um, tracking dirty pages uh, in anonymous memory. So they track how the threads are dirtying the memory. And it can also obsolete soft dirty and uh, the SIGBUS feature of the volatile pages because volatile pages are pages that can go away from under you and you get and see the feature to get the SIGBUS whenever the application tries to touch the page again. In this case, you can do it with user fault of name. The development branch, which has the more recent feature included, is uh, in my AA Git tree on kernel.org, of course, and that's all. So sorry if I was uh, late. Okay, so still one slide, which is just saying that in very short, there's an amazing amount of uh, room for further innovation because when I started, that was 20 years ago, I thought it was very late and everything was already done, right? <laughs> so uh, I'm very optimistic we still have a huge amount of innovation and uh, open source is the only possible way forward because things are way too complex these days to manage it in any other way. So um, my phone is also running line address, so it's running my own kernel and that's the way to go in the enterprise down to the mobile phones. That's all. Thank you, thank you. Sure, observation. Yeah, I should have mentioned there is also clean and dirty LRUs, as well as an, ev an evictable for many, right? So <laughs> I had to simplify, sorry about that. <laughs> Thanks. Right, so got the, the clarification. Thanks. Okay. <laughs>